Hello, my name is Trey Master 04 and welcome to my layout, otherwise known as the Great Smoky Mountains Railroad. If you remember about a couple of years ago when I was around 100 to 150 subscribers, I was going to produce, and I said I was going to produce, a layout tour. Well, then later that did never happen, and then come early last year, I said, yet again, I'm working on a, pro a new layout tour. However, that yet again never happened, and here we are a year later since the last time I said I was going to do a layout tour. And I do apologize for that. And the reason being why I haven't done that is because I can never get into a rhythm that I liked and a, also into a format that I liked enough to go and produce a video for you all to enjoy. On top of that, my layout is still under construction and back then my layout really wasn't as well developed as it is today. I mean, I didn't have any road systems, I didn't have as many buildings as I have nowadays, and also the main focal point being the mountain section of the layout wasn't even in existence. So really, every time I got into the project, I keep thinking, no, let's just put it off a little longer so that I can go and get this project done or that so that it looks a little bit better in the end result. Well, now I finally have concluded that now is a good time to go and do it as now I have trains running all over the layout. I have the main focal point 90% completed and also there's just plenty of stuff that I can talk about and you all can go and enjoy. So I do apologize for the extended and extended yet again release of this video, but I hope it is all worth the while or at least you hope so. So let's get into the details of the layout itself. Construction of the layout began around mid to late 2018 with both my dad and I starting off with dividing the layout into two different sections. The first section being the smaller of the two and it being called the mountain section. The mountain section measures about 15 feet long by four feet wide. Not the largest, but still long enough to go and hold everything that you're gonna see later on in this video. And then the second section became a little bit more difficult because it is going because it contains a lot of the major stuff such as the yard, both loops instead of just one loop, and also the main town along with a few other buildings. And the reason being why it's larger is because I wanted to accommodate an 072 loop. Now, it's nothing extravagant and it's not really much to be looked at scenery wise and the reason being is because I wanted to run larger locomotives. Now this section itself does really well accommodate that and I've been able to picturesque a nice little valley town with a main street. For the measurements of the large section the table measures in width about seven feet in order to accommodate the 072 curves and also a loop around of the main line or the outer loop and also the length is a lot longer as well. It measures 13 feet to give a lot of good views of long straightaways leading into the mountain itself. Construction the layout really has been slow over the time, but once I got the table up, in this case it being standard two by four plywood and homosote construction, it really started taking off from there scenery and track wise. Speaking of track, let's get into the track and power side of the layout. The layout, I originally wanted to use fast track as I had used it all the time on my previous layouts. And also I had accumulated a large amount of it planning for, or more of hope, hopeful thinking that I'd have a larger layout and more room to go and expand and produce just the dream layout that we all have up in our heads. As a result, I had all the fast track and right as soon as I was planning it out, I started realizing my fast track was not gonna work. And that being because one major flaw with fast track is if you take apart and put back together it a certain number of times, like I had, 
the center rails will actually start to get loose and create micro arcing when put together causing shorting and even more causing dead spots on the layout. So you might have power on one half of your layout, but then as the train goes over a certain section, the track gets loose and cuts power altogether. So as a result, I unfortunately had to go and scrap all of my fast track. I mean, I still have it all because I still want to do Christmas layouts and other hobby layouts for my local clubs. But instead, I used Atlas Track. Atlas Track has a great look to it. It's very sharp and it's also not a tubular rail so I won't have any kind of pins to deal with. However, the rail joiners do get a little fiddly when you're trying to put and put together and take apart the track but it works really well. The switches I'm not so keen on as the switch motors do easily can get broken and the switches also have an electrical problem every once in a while when trains go over it but overall Atlas is very reliable and I would suggest it to anybody who is wanting to build a permanent layout. Moving on onto the power sources itself, the layout is a bit on, incorporates the power in a different way. So in order to save space, I decided with the help of my dad to build a drawer. The drawer itself is long enough to contain everything inside, but also conceal everything. So when it is fully in position, the lid is up, the drawer is underneath the layout, it appears that there's nothing there and there's just a blank wall in front of you. But when it's pulled out and the lid's tucked down, it reveals all of the power sources and everything inside that controls the layout itself. The reason being I did this is because the walking space outside of the layout is very limited. And so how can, what was the best way to keep the power supply available, but not take up space on the walking side and also on top of the layout? Because reality, uh, reality space is key to any layout I, I have learned and so the drawer has been able to help that factor. For the power supplies themselves I use a slew of different types. First I use three ZWs, two post-war and one modern. The modern, po modern ZW I use it for primarily to power both the inside and outside loop due to because it has a built-in surge protector and also a circuit breaker so if a train ends up derailing itself, then it automatically cuts the power. Definitely something important when you're running many highly expensive legacy TMCC or even MTH models. The electronics do not like power surges, nor do they like shorts, so it's always best to have a power protector. The other two ZWs are primarily used for accessories, lights inside buildings, access powered accessories, and other things and whatnot. And then finally, I also use a CW80 to power a few smaller things that take up a little bit more power. And that thing was one of my very first transformers and, that I got around when I was three. And that thing is still working like a champ. For, and then finally, for command control systems, I use only Lionel's Legacy Cap 2 command system. Thanks to a friend named Dale, where I live at a local hobby shop, he was so gracious enough to give me his original 2006, 2000, uh, around 2006, 2008 legacy command system so that I can go and run my very first legacy engine. And this thing is wonderful. I would, it's what I use all the time for my videos to run my trains. And maybe I will go and upgrade to something a little bit further, such as the cab three. But as of right now, I don't have any plans to do so. Moving on from the layout dimensions, track and power statistics. Let's get into the theme of the layout itself. So the layout is dedicated to the Great Smoky Mountains region of Tennessee and North Carolina. The reason being is because I love, and so does my family, go, love going to the Great Smoky Mountains. Not because that we live there, for, I wish we could, but in this case, we just enjoy going and visiting there. It's a beautiful region, and it also offers a lot of railroading opportunities such as logging and coal mining, and something that a lot of people don't look at, tourism. So the layout itself, besides being located in a fictional valley of Tennessee, in this case, Reese Valley, the layout is also timed in the steam era of railroading. In this case, it's not specifically set to a certain date in the, say, in the 40s or the 50s, because I didn't want to go and hinder myself in choosing a certain date, even though there's a lot of great layouts that does that and 
do wonders with operations. I just wanted to be able to expand myself and have more limit, more open, less limitations on what I can produce for this layout. Maybe in the future, I'll select a certain railroad at a certain time in a certain location. But as for right now, this is meant to be an experimental operation, somewhat in the back of my mind kind of layout. So really, the layout is a mixture of both the golden era, end of the depression, to twilight era of steam. So really all of the main chunks that steam operated. And I chose these three because I, again, didn't want to limit myself. I wanted to have dirty, grungy, worn down locomotives and cars. So I chose the late of the Great Depression because railroads didn't have any money. But I also wanted to have plenty of newer big steam, such as the Big Boy or the Norfolk and Western J, to have fun running around the layout. But more importantly, I'll, there are a few diesels that I like, such as the Alco PAs and Santa Fe F3s, that I didn't want to limit myself even further and not even have those and it all be steam. Though primarily all my collection is steam, I still wanted to have myself to have some fun with it. So as a result, the era is the golden era of steam and furthermore, just a lot of great area to model in my opinion. Keeping with the theme of not wanting to limit myself, I also don't have a central railroad that I wanted to use on the layout. However, I do have a central idea of what the railroad is meant to be. And that is a subdivision of the Santa Fe. I live in the Santa Fe region of now BNSF, so I enjoy looking at Santa Fe locomotives and I enjoy collecting them. However, it does not mean that Santa Fe railroad equipment, cars, or anything of that nature is limited to this layout. However, I do have two other central themed railroads, in this case being the Pennsylvania Railroad and also the Southern Pacific, so, and Union Pacific in this case, on some occasions. And this being because the Santa Fe had connections, in my terminology, had connections obviously with the Southern Pacific, but when they moved down south, to the Eastern Tennessee parts, they also got connections with the Pennsylvania Railroad besides sending their 2104s up north during the summer and the end of the steam era. And the reason for this is because the idea is Pennsylvania, being in the Alleghenies, were subsidizing, subsidizing most of their railroads equipment, such as the Western Allegheny, down further south where they started reaching more and more coal deposits and more and more different types of resources. As a result, the Santa Fe and the Pennsylvania Railroad came together and were able to agree on a terms of being able to use either one of their locomotives through the late 50s deal when Santa Fe sent in a lot of their Texas types locomotives. And this really gave me an opportunity to take a lot of different unique oddball road names and combine them all together into some kind of central theme. In this case being, Santa Fe decided to produce another tourism spot. They originally started with the Grand Canyon line at the south rim of the Grand Canyon, but then decided to expand into eastern Tennessee. They realized tourism was really getting into a hot niche market and also realized that it would be a be double benefit besides doing tourism trains, but also cash in on some of the resources here, such as logging and coal mining. As a result, the railroad really morphed into a Santa Fe Mountain subdivision, that I like to call it, that is a branch line off of a what if rail of a what if Santa Fe main line that ran near the Southern Territory. As a result, the railroad is primarily used as a tourism line that brings trains up from Reese Valley up to Reese Ridge, stopping at the mouth of the coal mine that also gives tours periodically when crews are not working down in the depths of the mountain. But besides that, the line also services the coal mine itself by bringing resources up, down from the valley up to the top of the mountain and also exports coal out of the mine itself to fuel many of the locomotives that run on the layout. Periodically, we'll get a few interesting locomotives such as the Big Boy itself, a few daylight engines, and then even a few Santa Fe locomotives here and there. But primarily, the main road engines would be a West, former Western Allegheny 280, number 85, and also a Santa Fe coal-burning Mikado, number 3158.
With all the details out of the way, let's go ahead and switch things up, get a train put together, and follow it around the layout as we go and take looks at the major scenic areas of the layout. This is the art office. Do you read me? I copy that. Over. Stand by for track orders. Over. Yes, sir. Start up and stand by. Out. The train we will be following today is eastbound number one. It is a local freight train that brings supplies and empties up to the mine and then later picks up loaded coal cars and brings them back down to the valley. As you can see the train is making itself up by using the main road engine, in this case a Western Allegheny number 85 being borrowed by the Santa Fe thanks to their relationship from the late 50s from the Pennsylvania Railroad. And the yard, as you can see, the yard itself is actually fairly large for this layout. It takes up most of the space on the main table since I have a lot of rolling stock and I wanted to make sure I had plenty of storage for it all. The yard itself is consisted of Atlas switches, three of which leading into the yard spurs themselves and one leading for the main yard loop. For buildings, I used the Lionel floodlight towers and also a few other structures. In this case, I had a few servicing buildings laying around and I wanted to put in, put in them in the yard. And as you can see, it really does function well as a yard by holding cars itself and being able to move and make trains on the yard loop itself. With our train made up, our journey begins by passing the yard lead and, pa and begin passing by the east side of the town. The first few buildings we pass is the Rico Station, repurposed into a Santa Fe Depot with a smoking smokestack and also a servicing water tower. This side of the track is 072 curves and the loop itself do does go around the circumference of the layout. The town itself is based on a typical 1950s or older Main Street USA kind of style, where there's two main streets running down the middle and main industries and businesses running on either side of it. On one side, you'll notice that I've got a barbershop, radio station, the town hall, a soda shop, and finally a tavern. All these businesses are related to the railroad in some form or fashion, as every town needs to have a barbershop, the local radio station makes business by broadcasting news channels across the mountain. The town hall obviously need to have one of those. The soda shop acts like a sandwich shop for those who come off the mountain and the residents who are needing a little bit of food on in between things. And then the tavern is your typical tavern where they have dark dungy rooms, pool tables galore, and beverages to serve to both the railroad men and the miners at the end of the days. However, on the other side, it's a little bit more different. First up, we have the Red Owl 
grocery store. Grocery store is always needed amongst any town, so in this case, I placed it here. Next, we have the hobbies of the town people, in this case being Lionel and MTH trains. Both of these buildings are two of my favorites and seem to get a lot of competition since they are located next to each other. back up with our freight train, it is now exiting the east curve and entering into the back part of the industrial area on the way out. The industrial area is serviced by a spur, as you can see here in this photo, and primarily contains different industries that service primarily the coal mine and various other parts amongst the town itself, such as a lumber yard so that timbers can be shipped up to the mine and be used to support the mine shafts themselves, a storage building to hold all of the dry goods for the different supplies needed for the mine or even more importantly to the townspeople, a horse tack and feed store which supplies su supplies for horse feed, mule feed, and horseshoes for the mules and horses used up at the mine, and finally an elevator. In this case it is a repurposed Lionel grain elevator turned into a Santa Fe style similar to the station and is owned by the Santa Fe Railroad and is repurposed actually as a coal elevator since really in eastern Tennessee wheat or grain in particular was not really looked upon since the mountain earth was so rocky so instead they decided to change it into a coaling elevator hence, hence why it's put down in the industrial area. Eventually the train comes back around to the west side of the loop, again this curve being 072, crosses over a grade crossing leading back into the yard and then makes it to the junction. The junction itself is a simple two sets of 072 switches and leads back onto the main line, or otherwise known as the outer loop. The train eventually reaches the mountain on the way out. In this case, it enters tunnel number one, otherwise known as Black Bear Tunnel. And the reason why it was called Black Bear Tunnel is because a fitting black bear standing over the entrance of the tunnel. Now this tunnel also marks the beginning of the struggling grade that the train has to face as it goes through the mountain. As our train goes through tunnel number one and underneath the mountain, let me go and take a quick minute and discuss how I made the mountain. The mountain itself is of simple design. It's about three feet tall and is about a little over 10 feet long. Really is primarily the focal point of my layout and the how I was able to construct it is using the simple cardboard strip and plaster cloth method. As you can see here in these photos, I started simply by attaching cardboard strips to the main base, plywood bases of the layout, and then later covered it with plaster cloth. To add textures to it, I created paper buns made out of newspapers that I've accumulated over the years for this layout, were hot glued to the sides of the cardboard stripping, and then would be covered over the plaster covered by the plaster cloth. It gives it a rocky texture and also depth to the layout, and I thought it really gave it a nice look to it. For painting and scenery stuff, as you can see in this more modern photo, I simply just painted it in a earth tone brown that I watered down over the plaster cloth and also weathered it with a bit of gray to make it look like it's more of a rock texture, and then sprinkled it with 
flocking, Woodland Scenics flocking, sprayed it with hairspray to make it stick. And as of right now, most of the mountain is complete. However, as you can see on the left hand side, there are still areas of the mountain that still need to be completed. But then again, that's the fun of it as a layout is never completed. <laughs> Catching back up with our freight train, it soon comes back out of the mountain and enters right back into another one. This is tunnel number two. Tunnel number two is the shortest tunnel on the layout and is also a scenic focal point on the side of the mountain. However, this is not the only tunnel as the train eventually enters and disappears for quite some time into tunnel number three. Tunnel number three is one of the longest tunnels on the layout and also contains the last portion of the gradient on the layout. This section gains another five inches originally at this point in time on the ridge it's already five inches up above off the tabletop and eventually ends up at the end of the line at the mine at a total of 10 inches off the table reaching the top of the mountain is a total elevation of about 10 inches off the top of the tabletop here is located the main mine that I've been talking about earlier and it is currently populated with only a few handful of buildings as you can see, it is populated by two coal elevators, two mine shafts, and also a siding feeding into the mine itself. This area also has servicing facilities such as a water tower and a station to allow passengers to get on and off. I plan to make this area a whole lot more detailed in the sense that I'll be adding mining shacks, a blacksmith, and really turn this area into its own little habitat, so to speak. After refilling up with water, dropping off the empties and picking up the loaded cars off the siding, the train then enters into the final main tunnel on the mountain, tunnel number four. Tunnel number four contains the steepest gradient, as you can see here on this behind the scenes photo. And the reason why this gradient is so steep is because of space constraints. I had to go and do this in order to get the train back to ground level from 10 inches without having to build a helix, of course. And so, decision was made to go and make the gradient this large. making it out of tunnel 4 the train eventually goes down the longest section of track on the layout behind the industrial area of the layout and then enters into yet another tunnel. This tunnel is called Saw Hill Tunnel as eventually I will add a sawmill on top of the mountain. As you can see it's still under construction and hopefully will be finished very soon. Next the train goes around yet another curve and enters into yet another tunnel. This tunnel being called Church Hill since there is a church placed on top of it. And finally the train makes it back over another grade crossing and ends right back at the junction. Overall we were able to move two empties up to the mountain, pick up a couple loaded cars and finish the journey right here. And with that, we are at the end of the line. We are back right where we started with Union Pacific Big Boy number 4014 right in the yard loop. Thank you very much for watching this video and joining me for this lengthy tour of my layout. Good night, and I'll see you next time. <laughs>